What's up, y'all? I'm JJ McCorvey, a journalist who writes about business and blackness. And I'm Shayna Watson, a fashion industry professional and writer with my eye on the social and cultural impact of trends and style. And, and this, this is, is Yo business. business. Beans don't fry on the kitchen. Wait, what's the word? A fish don't fry in the <laughs> kitchen. A beans don't burn on the grill. Took a whole lot. Come on. There was no good ones left. Oh, I've it, done does that mean so, it's time to retire? It might be because I've done so many. And the ones that I still want to do are like so obvious. Okay. Well, that was this, nice while it lasted. This, this might be the end. Because I just like can't think of any more. Like there's some with black people on it, but not black shows. Mm -hmm. Which is probably a testament to like how many more we need because mm. that didn't even go on for that long but i actually was gonna do this one have you heard of the sitcom baby i'm back no what's that so it's, it sounds awful it only <laughs> had one season kim fields was in it as a kid the premise was that this man abandoned his family for seven years and then came back to find out the wife was engaged Wow. And like the theme song, I was like listening to this theme song earlier prepping for this. And the theme song is him being like, my kids were too young to know how much of a heel I was. And it's like. A heel. Who? Yeah. You never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> but also like who made this like stereotypical black men are garbage. Right. In the 70s. His family. Yeah. And then like the whole premise of the show was him just like being a rolling stone and then rolling back in and being mm -mm. mad that his wife had dated someone else mm -mm. after seven years that's why i didn't last for one season yeah i was like good somebody even <laughs> in the 70s was like mm, this is right. bad mm -mm. yeah so hey 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 we're back we back yeah did you like take a break with your break or no uh i took a work break with my break okay <laughs> um but it the break, but the break did make it a little easier. Yeah. 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 I, uh, so thank you guys for um, listening to the deep archives. Yeah. <laughs> I, hope. Right? I hope you guys went back and like binge listen because we, we have like put out a lot of stuff this season already. I think so. Yeah. I, when I think about like the breadth of everything we've done, I'm pretty proud of it. Like the topics we've covered, the, the guests. And we always talk on. about so much that like sometimes I think it's hard to digest. So. Yeah. Hopefully that was helpful. And then I did my little breather teaser because mm -hmm. um, we have like some dope guests coming up, too. So I hope you guys are like excited just to hear the kind of people that we have coming up. For sure. Yeah. All right. You ready to dive into your business? Let's dive. OK, let's start with like news news. OK. So impeachment 2020. Yes, please. Please. <laughs> OK, so did you hear your Auntie Maxine was hot on Twitter She's always this hot week. on Twitter. But did, do you think she tweeted this or someone tweeted this for her? What did she tweet? So she said, lowlife Trump, lying, crooked, tax evader, porn star, fornicator, <laughs> should take his ridiculous self home, resign, and free us of what we will have to do to impeach him and throw him out of office. That... Is hilarious. What you said, porn star fornicator. Por porn star for that Nothing like, like a church auntie to like right. get you together. I was about to say that sounds like my grandmother. Yeah, who's like apostolic, Christian, right? Like and then long skirt Christian. And she, did, yeah, you crooked, no down, <laughs> dirty lion. I'm like tax evader. Yes. He's a tax evader. Fornicator. <laughs> then she also tweeted, Trump is an embarrassing, un-American traitor. How dare he denounce and belittle VP Biden on foreign soil on Memorial Day? How how can these spineless Republicans look their spouses and children in the face and claim to teach them patriotism? <laughs> I was like, Auntie, did someone tweet like your 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 Twitter fingers are hot right. today? No, I think that's her because all of this is like in lockstep with like how with she how behaves she like she calls in these hearings. She fornicators in real life though. I don't know about that, and but she Twitter? does get people together. What uh, did she say? Reclaiming my time? That's true. Like, come yeah, on. Yeah, she's that, like, this sir. Is, this is her. So she was hot this week. I feel like she's like, you know, we must impeach. Like, we have to. It's the law at this point that we have to start this impeachment process. Yeah. And these are all the reasons why. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's just so much now. Like, how long are congressmen and women gonna overlook the damage that he's doing to right. 
the contract. But then as you read up, impeachment doesn't mean we get rid of him. No, but... Because I, the Senate has to vote, right? Right. Which are like... That's not happening. Right. But... Um, uh, the and he's not going to resign. He's not going to resign. No. I, I honestly don't think he's ever going to resign. <laughs> that's, no, that's how Handmaid's Tale I think it's going to plunge us into like dictatorship. I don't know. Oh, Lord. But... Um, but yeah, so I I think I think what a lot of Democrats are pushing for now uh, regarding impeachment is to at least have the trial so that you can call more people mm-hmm. like forward to talk about mm-hmm. uh, you know their experiences with Trump and talk about you know uh, possibly air things that we didn't know right. about him um, and his dealings with Russia or whatever right. um, and have that going on you know on TV twenty four seven like it did with you know, Bill Clinton's impeachment mm-hmm. trial and then have that affect his campaign going into 2020. Got it. So that's the hope. Yeah, that's the hope. Uh, <laughs> but I, yeah, I don't think at, at any point will Republicans ever, in the Senate ever be like, yeah, I, let's go ahead and impeach him. Right. Ever. No. Yeah. He can like, yeah. And then did you, I don't know if you also heard Thursday this week, he tweeted probably from the toilet, I had nothing to do with Russia helping me get elected. I did. See and so that. the people are like, so wait. And then he had to call a yeah, press conference. On the lawn to be like, uh, I mean, they didn't do it. They didn't do it. And if they did do it, I didn't help them. Like, you're <sighs> such an, a dumb dumb. Like, and I just feel like everybody that's put in place to make sure that his dumbness doesn't come out on Twitter is just failing all day, every day. He must yeah. have like phones hidden all around the yeah. house. I keep thinking, like, what must someone like Sarah Sanders be thinking? Like, what, what, what do you think her internal monologue is like while she's like yeah. running for Trump? I think you know how I, I feel about uh, white women's huge role in white supremacy. Hmm. So I don't feel like she goes home and is like, "Man, I'm doing a really bad thing." Like, I don't. Mm. I think she's just like. We got to do what we got to do. Yep, exactly. We got to do what we got to do. And if that means lying and cheating and stealing and stepping, then that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. I mean, well, speaking of like damage she's doing to the country, like these tariffs are crazy. Oh my gosh. Like the fact that you would level tariffs on Mexican uh, imported goods just for, uh, just to help your immigration. The cause and tirade is crazy to me because like a lot of these things are i think very soon we're gonna see go up in price oh duh avocados alcohol auto parts not avocado and, we already can't and, afford extra right. guac. <laughs> that's, that's already out of my budget um but then you think about like farmers you know and like uh, and working class people, and as we always say on this podcast, when you know hardship comes, who are the first people to feel mm-hmm. the brunt of it? So you already have like food deserts and people, you know, scraping by. But then they got now they gotta see uh, see how they can navigate tariffs as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, working in fashion, the China tariffs have effed our whole lives up really? because. Our, the the mo- majority of our factories are in China. And so that with this huge increase, mm-hmm. it's like really affecting how we have to work with those factories. It's affecting everything. And then like on a personal level, I started to think about like, you know, I fell in love with Turks and Caicos when I was there and they already have such a hard time getting food because of the tariffs that already existed. Mm-hmm. And so then when you increase that, like they're not going to have anything. The bread there was already $10. Wow. Right? And so it's just like, uh, he is really just like destroying it step by step, and it's like to what end? Yeah. Um, I, you know that's a good question. I I I don't venture to try to get inside Trump's head because it's a. I'm sure it's just a. Oh, it's a disgusting. Uh, <laughs> a mess. Yeah, you don't want to get in there. Um, but I I think I think um I was talking to my to my boyfriend the other day about how. <laughs> Sometimes, because you know he's just so like positive and happy go lucky most of the time, mm-hmm. and like sometimes I'll just like go off in the bathroom or something and like have like a a existential a thought of existential dread, uh, <laughs> and I'll come back in and be like, you know, what I just thought about Trump is likely gonna be like a dictator, you know, because he's, he's like, uh, he's, right, yeah, he's like, um, uh, okay, uh, we just watched right in the bathroom. You just Netflix, thought about that? But no, oh, I, I love it. <laughs> 
Um, but if you think about like the the, the world leaders who he likes and tries to cozy up oh, with yeah. more, it's uh-huh. like you know Kim Jong Un uh-huh. and and Vladimir Putin. It's like the people who like mm-hmm. you know lock up and murder journalists and murder people. Yeah, it's very scary. Um, yeah, I think we're just descending into authoritarianism. Um, it won't be long. Ugh, um, scared. Speaking of authoritarianism. Obviously, as as one does. <laughs> Facial recognition technology is increasingly on the rise. Mm-hmm. Um, you see like places like uh, in China, um, surveillance is everywhere. Um, they actually, a lot of the, the tools that I was listening to this podcast recently called uh, Crazy Genius uh, by The Atlantic. And they started talking about how... Um, how China, you know, has all these, you know, facial recognition um, uh, systems all over, you know, certain cities and like certain populations. Like if there's like a minority population um, of of Muslims, um, they will like test out like certain like sur- surveillance technologies on them to like make them afraid of their movements. And because you know, once someone is once you know you're always being watched, mm-hmm. you're more careful with how you work. Why Muslims? Um, because it's China and they're, it's a very, mm. they want it to be a very strict, homogenized, controlled uh, Like America. But so, right. But so <laughs> then the podcast on this episode, they started talking about how facial recognition technology was being used here. Mm-hmm. And they talked about this... Um, this uh legal fight that i didn't know what was going on in um brooklyn where uh landlords have started using facial recognition technology in apartment complexes and (laughs) of course most of these buildings where they're implementing these um these uh new technologies are uh mostly black residents that's surprising to me only just because like i can't even get my landlord to like fix a leaky sink much less put in Facial recognition technology, right, and part, and that's what I'm saying. Like part of it, I think that the reason that your landlord doesn't want to do that is similar to the reason that these landlords are putting in facial recognition technology to make people uncomfortable, so they eventually move. Oh, and, yeah, and they can then you know renovate the whole building and get some Ew. rich black folks. In. Yeah. So that's what's happening. I mean, my landlord's also just not great. And like, <laughs> I don't even know if it's about a discomfort. He just lives in Queens and he never wants to come to Brooklyn and right. fix anything. But, but if he could get all y'all out yeah. and then, you know, get in charge of higher rent, I'm sure he would be more on top of it. Um, so, yeah, so that's what's happening. Um, there's like this this movement now to, um, you know, in New York to, to stop um, uh, landlords from using facial recognition technology. Um, and you know, landlords are like literally like using it to to threaten and um and just surveil their their residents. Like there was, I was on the podcast episode. There was like one woman who was saying, um, so the I guess the cameras caught her. <laughs> the cameras caught her asking, like in the hallway, asking other people if they had gotten the notice about the facial recognition technology mm-hmm. system. And some of them didn't, some of them did. And so they saw her um, on the cameras and, like, uh, and didn't like the she was that asking? she was asking people. And they sent her, like, a threatening letter. And then they, they included a screenshot. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Exactly. We're, go- we're That's, dead. This is what I'm saying. We're dead. Um, so they sent uh, they sent her a screenshot, included in the, in the letter, and put apartment numbers over everybody's <gasps> head. Wait, so no. Like, yeah. So it's not just like cameras. It's not just like security cameras. It's like voice. Oh, I can. I I know who this person is. She, you know, in this, you know, in this recording. This how is, is that anime legal though? Blah, blah, blah. Well, that's that's what they're trying to figure out right now. I don't. I don't. I, th- I think that it's so new that there's just not any. You know, right. precedent yeah. for it, you know existing um, rulings that would out, outlaw it, um, but that's what's happening right now, it, right here. And because in, in they're York. renting and not owning, I do feel like there's probably a fight there of mm-hmm. like this is our building, like we're allowed to put in security cameras and like yep. you know New York in New York State, you only need one party to agree for a recording. Yep. So, oh, Lord, <laughs> <laughs> like what? Yeah, but I, I, but I. 
you know, this is part of a larger conversation about facial recognition technology and, you know, uh, the need to like regulate big tech and us needing to have Congress also do its job in, you know, making um making companies make smart decisions about like like when this technology is developed how does it get deployed right you know uh, and and leaving it up leaving it up to um shareholders you know of like an amazon which makes facial recognition technology and sells it to, to police departments um leave, leaving it up to them is not gonna like stop you know, like the the proliferation of the technology, like no, F- don't F- leave anything up to Jeff yeah. Bezos. That was a um, that was a a, a proposal recently um, that came up where um, shareholders at Amazon could have um, like pumped the brakes and been like, actually, you know, we care about you know how the company sells surveillance technologies to governments. You know, we see what's happening around the world. China is becoming more. Um, surveillance um uh oriented um some of these technologies are creeping into the united states and how we govern people so let's like hold off and like you know take a minute um and they voted down so (laughs) so that's an example of like what we need to just be smarter about this that's really scary and you know i feel like i we always talk about this dual problem with social media right or like with everyone having access to cameras all the time and it's like yes whenever cops do something awful then we're able to see it where we wouldn't before which can be good but Mm -hmm. then i also think it brings about this since we are tapped into everything and we have access to everything then like there's no limit to what can be allowed into our brains right it's like the video of them shooting that possibly pregnant woman it's Mm -hmm. like we have to see that now and Mm -hmm. like there's a new video that came out this week of police just pepper spraying uh, this handcuffed black woman or like beating this homeless black woman and it's just like i can't right like do and i don't watch them but even seeing the still shots it's like do it's it's good that we that they might have to be held accountable because of it but then what what is that doing for the trauma Right. of the rest of us to yeah. just like constantly be seeing black trauma in a loop. Yeah. And so I feel like even that with the facial recognition, it's like with cameras everywhere, we won't have the ability to cut out any of that. Yeah. It will just, it will just be a live feed of everything going on everywhere at all times. Right. All, all the horrible things. All the horrible things. <laughs> so it's like, aware. it's like raising awareness, but it's also like creating harm. Right. And, uh, in a lot of ways. Right. Um, well, you you mentioned like black trauma. I guess that's um, like what you talk about, and the things that we uh, are now exposed to um, is another reason why folks are kind of having this, this sort of backlash to a lot of documentaries and mm-hmm. movies and TV yeah. geared toward like black folks right because um, like suffering violence yeah when they see us came out on netflix which is ava duvernier's uh dramatic mini series about the central park five which i have heard that it's great but i've heard multiple people say like i wish i hadn't started watching it hmm. or just like i couldn't get through it because of the tears and just like i don't know if i'll ever be able to finish it hmm. and there was an article recently in fast company about and the writer talked about like just deciding to opt out of black trauma and i feel that very deeply you know me like i don't watch i'm very protective of what i watch because i just know once i see i can't unsee um and so but but it's hard to like then also want to consume this like great black work but then figure out the balance between that and then making sure that we're like protecting ourselves it's like staying knowledgeable but then also maintaining some self-care yeah i guess for for me then the question is like then who who would it be uh made for then like right. if we, like if, if if black people are opting out yeah yeah i just i just worry because i don't i can't say with certainty that you know white folks will watch it and learn mm-hmm. you know like mm-hmm. we are the ones who consume you know that um uh, that kind of content like and i want to i want more of it to be made for that same purpose to educate folks and like people need to know that like you know trump was you know before he 
became right. Trump. He was he, being he was awful one, for a really long time. Right. And he was the one who was like taken out in the New York Times, like in mm-hmm. the 80s, like uh, advocating that these innocent young black men um, were uh, be executed, get, be executed and get mm-hmm. the death penalty. And even after it came out that they were right. innocent, he still to this day refuses to apologize. Right. So uh, it's like people need to know that that is the same Trump that is now a president. But yeah. at the same time, like you said, um, we have to be careful um, with how much we consume of it. And even like um, uh, in addition to when they see us, uh, See You Yesterday came on Netflix, I think. Uh, no, explain la- what week. that is. I've heard about it, but I haven't. Seen so it's it. basically. So have you heard of um, Kendrick by Octavia Butler? Yes. So it's very similar in that, um, you know, in Kendrick, um, the main character, you know, she, this woman living in the '80s, and she gets transported back to uh, to slave times, what, and she gets transported and uh, back into slavery, becomes mm-hmm. one of her ancestors, right? And she doesn't exactly know what's going on, and it's similar. Um, there's a similar uh, mechanic here where there's time travel, and uh, I mean, spoilers, spoiler alert. <laughs> oh no! Um, Wait, what if I want to see it? Is um, it necessary? I mean, if you don't want to watch Black Trauma, you might not want to. Oh, did it just come out? Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll put we'll put spoiler in the yeah. show notes in case there's people. police there's police brutality. Something happens, and this young girl who's um you know a young black girl, she's brilliant. Um, she's a scientist, and she figures out time travel, and she try she tries to go go back in time to fix what happened to change what happened. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. I saw the previews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really good, but it similarly it is very, very like <laughs> traumatic. And yeah. like and because it's time travel, you see these things happen over and over again throughout Ugh. the movie. No. But it's good. You know, Spike Lee um uh produced it. Um so I was I was very when it ended, I was very happy that it was made. Mm-hmm. Um that's the feeling that I came away with. But also like uh, you know, I had to like have a drink after. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, and again, I want people to see that, but I also understand like how we have to be careful. Like like when 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 they see us came out last night, I really wanted to watch like the first episode of that, but because I was already kind of down about some other stuff, like I was you know deliberate mm-hmm. and, and intentional on not watching it that night. Yeah, and we've even talked just... about that with the R. Kelly documentary or whatever that was actually called, and then um. The Finding Neverland, right? It's just like we have to be protective, and mm-hmm. it's like yes, we want to be aware, and yes, we want to like support this content. But at the end of the day, like we're the only ones with these minds, and we have to make sure that we're keeping um, keeping them safe. Yeah. And I feel like I, I've you know emotionally, I felt fine this week until yesterday when i read about the virginia beach mass shooting yeah i think that like it really like deflated me and you see me like today i like have a headache i don't normally have that like i just think the new like the news cycle is so feel so hopeless and i will be very honest that you know that there's a a running joke around a running dark joke around that whenever you hear about things like this it's like every racial group is crossing their fingers hoping that the shooter wasn't one of us right Mm -hmm. like i think muslims i'm sure do it like as Mm -hmm. black people and so like to hear that this black man um who worked for this company for 15 years killed i think the count is up to 11 or 12 people um Mm. i just was like because it's unfortunate i think when white people are terrorists there isn't a sweeping notion that all white men are terrorists right right but unfortunately minorities don't get that right i don't think i don't think like white people when there's a mass shooting right or like please, oh, please don't, please don't be one of they us know, like, either way like it's they'll be not, fine right they'll be fine yeah. there's no like immediate like right. um stereotype that's gonna be yeah and after. no one's gonna go out and then gun down white men now because they think every white man's a terrorist whereas we see with like a la Liam Nielsen or whatever his name is. Was that his name? Who like wanted to. Liam Neeson. Yeah, Liam Neeson. (laughs) Yeah, it's like a la him that like you find out one black guy did something and all of a sudden you're going out looking to kill every black guy, right? And so I just, uh, I'm just sad. I'm sad that 
we don't have gun control. I'm sh- sad that there has been like 150 days in the year and there's been like 150 shootings like it's just like we what i don't know when enough will be enough but it's obviously not every time it happens when it's children when it's in a church when it's like you keep thinking that something will spark people to say all right we've gone too far but it it hasn't happened the only thing that gives me a little hope is that i've been reading that the nra is losing some of its power because of their um they're having some kind of like internal leadership struggles mm. um and um so, and and it's it's because some of them want to cooperate with um who was that that was some that was some legislator um a politician i can't remember who was like asking who was subpoenaing documents and like asking them to like uh be more forthcoming about where they were getting their money from mm-hmm. and so uh, it, which some of it is Russia. And so um, uh, some there's one person in leadership there who wants to comply because if not, then it could be catastrophic for the entire organization. Then there's another faction that wants to like just ignore the, uh, the request. And so because of that, you know, they've, they've become a little less powerful. So I hope that that's like a trend, you know, a trend yeah. and like, you know, maybe a good omen that, you know, some of the NRA's influence wanes over um, the influence that it has over Congress and we can get something done, but it, it, it just sucks. Yeah. And one last, just sad, but similar to your NRA thing, maybe has some hope. Um, so R. Kelly was now hit with 11 more counts of sexual assault, which for me, it's just like, how do we need a billion before he goes to jail? What's happening? Like, I'm sure that the number can go on and on, and, and I'm sure that this is helping them to build a stronger case, because I've heard that some of these counts hold up to 30 years. Hmm. So it's like, prayerfully, we're getting to a place where he'll never see the light of day again. But then also, why is he out? Why isn't he in jail now? Why wasn't he in jail when he murdered, when he married Aaliyah? <laughs> I'm about to say, hello, who did he murder? <laughs> I, mean, he did. I mean, he didn't. That, oh, that we know of, right. but when he married that fifteen-year-old, like I'm just like tired of him being out. I'm tired of, of us talking about him. Like it's time to be done. But I'm hopeful. What, what, what hopeful. were the What were the new counts? Do we know? Eleven. It's just eleven more counts of sexual assault, and like I think three of them were connected to the victims being underage. Mm. So it's the same things that he's been doing for literally the past twenty five years, if not longer. Um. So, I don't know. Maybe something will come of it. Maybe. Um, Wow. Three counts of aggravated criminal sexual abuse of a victim between the ages of 13 and 16. Yeah. And he's like 50 now. Oh, my God. Gross. Oh, he's free because um, somebody paid his $1 million bond. Why? Because he doesn't have any money. (laughs) I know. So, I, I, I wonder who paid it. Gross. Um, um all right yeah, and then we had some black on. folk business news yeah so i saw something very interesting um so i think a lot of people probably don't know that um instagram's uh head of design is a black guy his name is ian spalter um and i read recently that um ian is uh stepping down as head of design um and uh, he's going to be leading um, design uh, of Instagram's Japan office. Okay. Which I thought, you know, cool, you know, like keep keep moving, black man. But <laughs> but then um, I started reading about, you know, how he's been vocal about um, he, he's helped to like stop some projects within Instagram that um, could be, you know, uh, problematic. Um, oh, Ian's speaking up. Yeah. <laughs> is that why? So, so did he step down or they and, pushed him down? Exactly. So that's why I'm saying I don't, you know. Right. That, don't know if it's I, actually yeah, good. I don't want to say that that's what happened, but all I know is he spoke out <laughs> um, last uh, fall um, about how he used his position to convince Instagram to not um, uh, ship this uh, this augmented reality experience that um that could be 
considered um, cultural appropriation and offensive mm. to black people. Hmm. Um, and so one, I wonder. And IG's like, that's how we make our money. <laughs> Get out of here, Ian. Right. right. Then you see, then you see how good Red Table Talk is <laughs> exactly. doing. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and Kylie's our biggest hit. So if you want no cultural appropriation, don't bring that shit over right. here. So, um, <laughs> so it's I mean, so funny to think about them being like, uh, actually, we want to appropriate cultures. That's how we Japan. make money, Ian. Yeah. Go to Japan. <laughs> no, I, really, I honestly, I hope that's, I hope that's not the case, uh, and I hope that this is like another, you know, step up for like a black executive to have influence at, at you know, a, another level of the company. But also, I also hope that you know they install some other people. In his stead, who can, you know, put some checks on, you know, I mean, because we all, you know, you know, whenever there's like black leadership in a company, we always kind of end up being that check, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I don't mind doing. I think you know, Don and in one of our recent episodes uh, talked about that, like, you know, some some of us don't mind doing it. It kind of comes with the territory, right? right? Um, uh, so I, it's not that, you know. And I think that's part of the responsibility of a seat at the table mm. is like you're at the table now. And so you got to like check yeah. stuff when you see it and maybe check stuff when you see it and it lead to something else, you know, but well, good for Ian for saying something in the yeah. first place. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, the stepping down is like the recent news, um, the, uh, him saying something that was like last fall, um, well, I don't want to. I don't want to like put it out there that this is a direct connection, but I also wonder. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have some <laughs> news yeah. that you thought was very interesting. So I feel like when I said this news to you, you like made a face. Uh huh. But so you know, Nipsey Hussle, he had um, his trademark, the marathon continues, and like. His store was called Marathon, and he had a clothing line around it, and that was just his phrase. And so Crips are looking to trademark the phrase now. Um, So there's a Crips holding, which is called Crips LLC, and on May 16th, they filed for the trademark. And in the documentation, they said that they will also allow the bloods to use it because they called a truce and they want wow they want any money that is be able that is gleaned from this to from be this used trademark. towards yeah to mm-hmm. be used towards the community so what i love about this is like gang violence aside i think that it is a big step for black gangs to make themselves a company as white gangs have done right like hell's angels has been incorporated for a very long time. Mm. Motorcycle gangs in general, Harley Davidson, the whole, like they've been legitimized in such a way that anytime you wear a Hells Angel, anything, talk about it, wear a logo, they make money from Mm -hmm. it. And so it's like about time for our gangs Mm -hmm. to also be able to trademark something and then use that money inside of the community. So it's like, while I'm not supporting gang activity, I am supporting making a business I am supporting doing what white folks have been doing for a very long time. Mm-hmm. I support the the truth part of it that like this uh, agreement that okay we're gonna both trademark this and any money that's made from the trademark going into like is it going to organizations? Or? Yeah, there's like community involvement okay. organizations that they have that I'm down with. Yeah, the part that like the, when the face that I made <laughs> when I saw the when you told me the news was I just hope that. It came from me hoping that it didn't, that money didn't go toward funding gang activity. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I definitely don't think. And the Crips, to be fair, like, have been legitimizing themselves for a while. They have businesses. Like, I don't know if you watch uh, Trigger Warning Mm-mm. with Killer Mike on Netflix. It's a really good show. But um, he helped them brand a cola and put it in, like, bodegas around. Wow. On, like, Is um, it called Crip Cola? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I was kidding. Yeah. And like, I, oh, Cripacola. Cri- Cripacola. Oh, yes. And so it's just like, at the end of the day, gangs, <laughs> gangs are not a far cry from secret societies or fraternities, mm-hmm. right? It's just like, there's violence involved with all of those things. And so I don't feel like, I feel like gang has been derogatory and we use gang specifically for minority groups of people right. when white people have had 
lodge clubs and K-K-K. secret societies and cake <laughs> the damn KKK <laughs> and I'm sure that they're not using their money for community environment right but then Black Panthers were a gang right so right. that's why I'm just like I don't I don't look at gangs I don't look at Crips and Bloods and generally think gangsters mm-hmm. at this point I think that they've done a lot to evolve into they have a, a freaking LLC like yeah business is in mind and so i think what was cool about that is like nipsey hustle for all his flaws did talk a lot about black ownership and buying black back the block so it's like nice to see that after he's gone people are still carrying that Mm -hmm. along so i thought that was good news i liked it for sure and then are we gonna stand about rihanna (laughs) um we can stand a little you know i so the news is that Rihanna um, launched her luxury brand Fenty, which I think is a cool name, mm-hmm. right? And I like the logo too. It's like, did you see it? Mm-hmm. It's it's like Fenty, but all like cool design. Yeah, and I think it's smart that the music is Rihanna, and then everything else she does is like yeah. Fenty Puma, Fenty Beauty, mm-hmm. Fenty. You know, like she's making that. sure that she separates that. Yeah, I dig that. So she's partnering with LVMH. Uh, Moet uh, Hennessy, um, Louis Vuitton to launch this brand, and she became the first black woman and woman of color to run a major luxury fashion house. Um, and it says here from in this, um, uh, I think this is from the New York Times, and the first woman to launch an original LVMH brand, which is big. It is, it's big for her. I'm annoyed that LVMH is able to continue to handpick blacks hmm. to be relevant. Hmm. That's I'm that's it. I'm just annoyed at that. <laughs> like y'all y'all really don't want to do anything to actually expand diversity, but when you see a black you like mm. and you see a business that you know you could be put back on the map for a la Virgil Abloh, yeah. a la Rihanna, then you're like, come on in. I totally agree. Um, it it is a bit of um, it's not tokenism. It's uh, because it's Rihanna. It's more like uh, vultures. Vult. Yes, culture, culture vultures. vultures. Yeah, culture. I can never say that. Culture vulture. Culture vulturing. Yeah. Um, and not like to your point, like doing anything to uh address the real issues of diversity. So right. it's okay when you when you recognize that blackness, you know, helps you on a when um, it's celebrity when blackness, it's celebrity you're okay with you, it. You have immediate returns. It's yep. Rihanna. Yep. Um yeah, there's no risk to this. Right. She there neither of them are risky Negroes. Right. So yeah. Good for her. Class for Rihanna, like with whatever she's doing, I feel like she's such a boss. I'm just annoyed by like brands being able to benefit off of our dopeness. Yeah. But, you know, there's two sides to it. But I do think that's an awesome segue into our next segment, which we're doing something a little different this week, which I'm excited about. So instead of an interview segment, we're going to do a segment called eavesdropped Mm -hmm. and so both of us have had dope conversations with people this week that were like yours was a real interview mine was literally just like sitting in a classroom talking to a great person um and so we're going to talk a little bit about what we talked to them about so come on back okay so this week we're doing something a little different it's just us Mm -hmm. no guests it's me and you now. Who's that? I've been waiting. Who that? Think I want to make Wait! <laughs> I know that song! Cassie. Diddy's nah. old flame. Who was that? Cassie. Cassie! Yeah. I might bump that when you leave. But you know, I liked when Cassie just left him. Yeah. Uh, she, <laughs> she was, was like, like, no I've more. I've had enough. Yeah. yeah. I've had enough. Yeah. And now Diddy's like father of the year. But okay. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we're doing a segment that I'm actually super excited about. So instead of a guest, so you and I this week, um, yours was more planned than mine, but have just kind of had these conversations with people that really resonated with us. And so we wanted to be able to share those because we couldn't like take out our tape recorder right then, or I couldn't, um, we wanted to be able to share those with our listeners. So, um, do you have an eavesdrop? 
Yeah. Uh, so my eavesdrop is uh, from uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. Mm. So she, I think she's, she's a, a she's Delta. A, is she? She's something. <laughs> Let me look um, before I claim her. Uh huh. I know y'all be you sorority. Ooh, y'all be we be claim every yeah body. Yeah. Um. No, no so- she's a Delta. <laughs> hey, sorority. <laughs> So uh, she is, uh, you know, mayor of Atlanta. Um, she's one of like, you know, I think like three or four now of um, uh, black mayors uh, since 1973. Um, Atlanta has consecutively um, installed black mayors, um, which I think is awesome considering that the city is more than 50 percent black. Right. Um, and, and a black woman at that. And a black woman. That's awesome. Um. But, you know, I interviewed her for the story I'm writing uh, for Fast Company about Atlanta and entrepreneurship. And and I won't get into, like, all the politics of it. But I guess my takeaway from the interview with her was I didn't realize that even in a city that is majority black, has a majority black city council, um, has a long history of like black leadership. Um, you know, Martin Luther King was born, grew up there. Um, Andrew Young, um, all these like really big figures. And despite all that, the city is like still finds itself like at odds with the conservative politics of Georgia. Mm. Um, and so, you know, we just, it, it just like talking to her really like opened my eyes to like the dynamic that, um, it's still at play that has been at play for a long time. Like you see, like remember, like Black Wall Street and mm-hmm. what happened to that. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> they burn it <laughs> right. to the ground. <laughs> and we often see, you know, um, we we often see um, folks, you know, be like, "Well, black folks, just if you don't, if you're not happy, go right. and Make do your, your own, own thing. thing. Do your own thing." We have and <laughs> and um, and uh, you know, Atlanta's full of people who have and still state policies um uh try to uh eat into that Mm -hmm. right and try to um try to uh pull the rug up from other the black leadership in the city and so a couple things that uh happened with that recently that are examples is one the georgia ban um georgia abortion Abortion. ban Mm -hmm. and i can't remember like uh how many weeks um the georgia law was for but it was you know Pretty. I think it was six, which is yeah. no time at all. Okay. As a result of that, Atlanta is going to be suffering now, which she also uh, uh, talked about, because um, she and some of her predecessors created all these tax incentives for a lot of uh, movies to be filmed in Atlanta. Like a, you might see, like when you go to the movies, you know, and then at the end credits, there's like a Georgia peach mm-hmm. uh, up there. <laughs> and that's because a lot of, your favorite movies like Black Panther was filmed there. A whole bunch of like Disney movies and like oh Black Panther you know, was filmed HBO, there. Mm-hmm, That's like, HBO cool. shows are filmed there um, at different lots, and um, uh, that is because the city has you know made it cheaper for studios to do that. Which you know, and so when they come and they bring these uh, crews and you know and everything to the city, you know it supposedly gins up like economic growth like they stay in our hotel they stay in atlanta's hotels mm-hmm. and like you know patronize it did Atlanta. you say our hotels nope i didn't say that you don't live there <laughs> uh, you i'm still riled up from, anyway. us, from when you got back and so what you see now in a lot of the headlines um with uh, in the entertainment headlines is you know uh uh, studios and and directors and producers are starting to boycott Georgia and saying, "Well, we won't film there." Like Netflix recently came out and 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 said it wasn't happy with uh, what was happening in Georgia and that it was considering like not filming there. Um, and so, you know, again, like that then takes away from Atlanta's economic power. So, like, of course, like, the governor... Yeah, they're going to uh, think about is, it <laughs> You know, that... No, but that's what I'm saying. Like, they don't... I don't think they... They don't care about somebody like Netflix pulling out their business, pulling I business out? I don't think they would be. Even, like, um, Brian Kemp, who, by the way, is the governor who stole Stacey Abrams' uh, seat when mm. she was running for governor in mm-hmm. Georgia. Um, 
Brian Kemp already said, you know, uh, yeah, we know people are not, you know, happy, you know, with the ruling or whatever, but, you know, you know, we, we don't care about liberals and their blah, blah, blah. Um, so, so again, like, I, I think that, I think that it, I, I, I don't, I don't know enough to say that it is intentional to take away black, you know, some of the um, economic sta- standing of this majority black city. Mm. Um, but I do know that they don't care. Right. <laughs> I yeah, think, I like, think we'll that, that much is evident. Um, and the other part that, um, the other initiative that is happening or has happened recently that kind of is another sign of this is um, Hartsville-Jackson Airport, which is in Atlanta, which is the busiest airport in the world, which is locally controlled um, by this, you know, majority black city government. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the state legislature tried to, like, take take control of gov- of the airport recently. So what is Keisha saying? So Keisha, Mayor Keisha right. Bottoms. <laughs> Um, well, that's what I'm saying. So she she was very, she wasn't like, she didn't go off, you know, in our interview, but she talked about how this isn't like the first time, mm-hmm. you know, like she was like, we know what's at play here. Mm-hmm. She was saying how, um, you know, whenever you have, and she, and she did like admit to like needing to like make some of the, like the um, processes more efficient, like who gets contracts, you know, to like open up a shop in the in the airport or whatever, um, make that more efficient, clean that up. Um, but she was direct in saying that, you know, I agree with the lot with the state legislature, this, you know, I do not agree in, ref- in reference to the, um, to the abortion ban. She was like this, I do not agree on. And, you know, we're going to feel it, mm-hmm. you know? And she said that she has to continue to tell the story of, Atlanta. Yeah. Um, which I think is was kind of coded language, you know. Yeah, of um, the real Atlanta. The real Atlanta. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I guess it was more of like a she didn't like tell me any like tea. Ad, any like tea or like advice personally for me, but um but what I took away from the interview was that um one like black uh economic power and influence will in America will always be under assault. Mm. And um and then two, um when when you're a black when you're a black leader, like you're always having to play you're always having to walk a fine line mm-hmm. between you right. know pleasing your people and right. uh, and um and also negotiating with the people the people yeah who might not want you and your people to succeed right yeah well good for her go ahead soror do your do your job (laughs) um so mine and i'm just gonna well i'll set the stage and then i'll put my proclamation out there so yesterday i had the opportunity to be a speaker at career day, at a career day this is my very first one come on um, speaker <laughs> it was i was at the future leaders institute charter school which is right up here in harlem and um it was really dope like the school is majority black and um i think it like made me step back and be like i do have a career that i can like talk to these kids about so i show up there and all the uh, all the presenters are sitting in this little room before school starts and the last presenter comes in, and it is none other than Dapper Dan, whose store is on the same street as this school. So he, like, knows these kids. He sees them when they walk home. So it's, like, Dapper Dan, his executive assistant, his brand manager, and his photographer just, like, stroll in. Wow. He was dressed, duh, impeccably. Of course. And, um... Do we need to remind listeners who Dapper Dan is briefly? We shouldn't. If you... I mean, <laughs> like, Google it. Oh. <laughs> like... I just no. Okay, go so, ahead. <laughs> Dapper Dan, do you Google Dapper Dan Gucci, like. And there you. Have and it. there you have it. But you know, and he's he's uh, he's been doing so much pre Gucci mm-hmm. that it's like it's interesting that that is what you would have to Google to get the story. But Dapper Dan has just been a cultural staple, especially in Harlem, for such a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. 
I will put it in the universe. We will have Dapper Dan on this show. I feel it. Make it happen. In my bones. He was so great and like so personable. Um, and, you know, I've I've talked about him on this show before and in connection to Gucci, basically asking like mm-hmm. where he is because I know that he has been doing a push for them in diversity and Gucci still seems to be doing racist things. And this is what I feel about manifesting is like I talked about that and said like, where are you, Dapper Dan? And literally yesterday I got to ask him. Mm. And so I'm speaking at this this career day. I I one of my I had to do five sessions. So I was in five different classrooms. One ended early. So I went downstairs back to this original room to just like get water and chill out before my next one. And Dapper Dan comes in. No one else is in the room. It's me, Dapper Dan, his executive assistant and his brand manager. Wow. And so he's just sitting there. And I so I tell him I'm like, we're just like sitting there in silence first. And then I say, I was like, you know, the room I was just in, you were in there first. And so all the kids, when they found out I worked in fashion, wanted to know if I worked with you. And he's like, oh, that's funny. Like, kids think that fashion's like all one big thing. And I said, I know that you're doing work with diversity at Gucci. Like, how is that going? What's happening there? Mm. And he goes, you know, the embarrassing part for the company is what has to come first he's like then what comes next is the conversations which is what i'm doing and he's like we're not there and we're not perfect and so i like that he recognized that and he said but you know i'm gonna stay on the inside and and he gave that advice to me because Mm -hmm. i i told him how frustrated i get with the whole culture fit that Mm -hmm. my company uses to explain away why everyone looks the same Mm -hmm. right and And why they don't hire certain people. Right. And he was like, you know what? That is frustrating, but take that frustration on the inside and like start to have those conversations. And he was saying, you know, I get the boycotts and I get that we want to pull our money. But he said black black consumers in America make only four percent of Gucci's revenue. Hmm. So when a black American stop buying Gucci, Gucci's fine. He was like on an international level, maybe it's bigger. But here in the U.S., like. Black people, we don't. your dollars aren't making or breaking us. What is making or breaking Gucci is black culture. And so he's like, that is our real currency. We have money, but the real currency is the fact that culture doesn't move until we move. Mm-hmm. And knowing that we have that power on the inside, we are we can garnish that. Is garnish the word I want to use? Brandish. Brandish, mm-hmm. yes. We can brandish that to get what we need. I told him that I was surprised that my company hasn't had a public embarrassment similar to H&M just because there aren't any people of color making those decisions. And he goes, just wait. Because he knows that like this is what's going to happen. Um, and so I think what I really took from my conversation with him is the importance of staying at the table mm. and that there is a place for entrepreneurs because he said that he was like you know people said to me do your make your own brand he's like people say to me all the time dapper make your own brand and he goes i will but at this point my stuff is selling out in china i couldn't have done that on my own Mm. and so i'm i'm making my name bigger he's leveraging the resources yes Mm -hmm. i'm making my he's like i'm being flown all over the place on gucci's dollar and then when i suck up all that i can and i've made a difference there then yes, I'll make my own thing. That's a good lesson. Right? And so I really like that balance. Like, I think sometimes we're pushed. Even at this career day, there was a speaker that went before me that was talking about, like, you don't have to go work for other people. You can work for yourself. And it's like, yep. Or you could work for other people. Soak up all those resources. Like, Dapper Dan said he fully recognizes that, like, his life would be very different had Gucci not come into it. Mm. And he's like, I'm going to use that for all that it's worth. And so I feel like he answered some of my my skepticism about why he was doing this. He was just like, no, I, I don't, I'm not in here thinking that Gucci all of a sudden is like, doesn't see color or isn't racist. Cause they pulled me in here, hmm. but I'm here now. And so I'm going to like do what I can do while I'm here. I like that. So he has a fan in me. Cause I, I think he just was like a, a uncle for sure. And he was just like sitting down chatting with everybody. And then afterwards they were going to another school to speak. Cause like his executive assistant was like, he would do this all day if we would let him. He wow. would just like go to schools in Harlem and talk to the kids I all day. That. Yeah. That kind of makes me, that kind of makes me realize like the flush, that, that's also kind of the flushed out uh, lesson from mine, from my talk with 
Mayor Bottoms too, mm-hmm. as opposed to like uh, in addition to like the news stuff and the social issues and the things that we have to go up against. You know, is st- staying at the table. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, right. Like staying boycotting and like, is not always right. The yeah, answer. we can't like, always you walk still have away. To work with these people yeah. to get something done. Right, and not just for us. Like that's what Dapper was talking about. He's like, not just for us. Like for these kids. Mm-hmm. Like if we walk away now, then th- then them getting to the table will be even harder. Right, and so that's I good. appreciated it. I can't wait to have him on the show. <laughs> I'm glad you're speaking. I'm glad you're speaking I do, into I want to existence. I start speaking yeah. these things, especially when I'm like literally sitting in a room across the table from Dapper Dan at 8:30 in the morning. Like that just felt like, what am I doing here? Mm-hmm. If I'm not so proud of for you. this, thank you. It was really fun. The kids were like, my t- the top questions I was asked were, how old are you? <laughs> how much money do you make? Did you answer everything? I did. Well, the money I didn't tell the amount, but I did tell them that you know once you I get. Feel baller. No. I told them once you get the education and you go in confident, you can ask for what you want. So I was like, I I said, I'm not going to tell you the amount, but I'm going to tell you that I'm making the amount that I asked for. Mm. And the girl's like, oh, (laughs) these are like seventh and eighth graders. I love that. Um, So, yeah. So that was our ease dropped. And I think, you know, obviously, like we love having our guests on, but sometimes we don't get the opportunity to talk about these like real life things that happen to us. So I'm glad that we just like yeah, took a breather this like week. This. Yeah. yeah. And talked about that stuff. But all right. You ready for L L C? Let's do it. Let's make yeah. it quick. Okay. So final LLC. Mine can go so fast. So I'm going to do mine first. My loved was uh, this little black girl that I follow on Instagram called her name is simply underscore Madison Jade. She's adorable. Um, she you might have heard about her. She had a, a viral video a while ago where she said, you know, don't listen to boys because they'll hurt your feelings. <laughs> I do remember yes. that. This so, is same girl. Right, same girl. <laughs> so she went to see Aladdin, the new Aladdin movie, which I also saw, which I enjoyed. I know there's issues with it. I think Will Smith did a great job. But... <laughs> She said to her mom, she said, you don't need a boy to take you to see the whole world. Jasmine can go by herself or Aladdin can go by himself. There's not enough room on the carpet. She said a princess doesn't need a prince to rescue her. She can rescue herself. Oh, that not enough room on the carpet. Not is enough room on the damn carpet. <laughs> like, and right. Because it wasn't just about go by yourself, but it's just like logistically. I have my own. I have my own carpet. <laughs> and and that, I love that she said, or Aladdin can go by him. I'm not saying he can't go, but yep. like, you don't need to wait for him to take you. I love it. And she said her mom was like, well, wait, you didn't like that. And she's like, Mm-mm. I think she's four. Like, she's just like, you I could go that. by yourself. So, yeah, that was my loved. Um, my cancel this week was is white girl, white girl twerk videos. Mm. So... <laughs> They, a lot of them exist, but the Shade Room posted one. And, like, if you read the comments, which you, of, of course, should never do, black people are like, oh, she got herself a black man. Give her a, a key to the barbecue. Why? Because she can twerk? Because she put her hair in cornrows and, and she can twerk? She's, like, part of the family now? And at what point is twerking synonymous to being a black woman? Disgusting. I'm so grossed out by it. I just was like, cancel all of it. White girls, go out and do what you want. I mean, you're all, like, if you're watching black girls twerking and you've learned how to do it, more power to you. But it does not change anything about your race, about the community that you belong to. Like, about your privilege. About your pri- None of that. Mm-hmm. You are still a white woman now with a, a booty bigger than most white women, which, like, I don't know where they're getting these from. And... <laughs> <laughs> Like, what? I've seen a lot of white girls recently with big butts, and I don't get it. Squats? No. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I just, like, I want a bigger butt. Both my parents are black. Um, so, yeah, cancel that. And then my learned, so my overarching learned was that being yourself gets easier. Hmm. So, you know, I'm in therapy, and I... I would say two years ago, as you know, as being my best friend, like two years ago, I had a lot of trouble just like saying what was on my mind, not being happy all the time, not looking pretty all the time, being worried that being myself was too much for people. And it's getting a lot easier to say what's on my mind. And if it if I'm not your cup of tea, then like get another cup of tea. Mm. And I read uh, The Guardian had 
an article out this week that said that unmarried and childless women ranked amongst the happiest subgroup from like a survey. And that just made me also feel comfortable in the fact that I'm not married on purpose. I don't have children, nor am I positive that I ever want them. And it's that is fine. And if I'm talking to someone who marriage is a top priority at this moment and children are a must have, then I might not be your person. And that is fine, too. And so I think my learn this week was really just feeling a lot more comfortable and recognizing the ease that it is to just like speak up without being worried whether you'll like it or not. I love that. Yeah. (laughs) We're moving on up. Moving on (laughs) Up and forward. Yes. All right. What are your LLCs? So I just have a learned and a canceled. Mm-hmm. So my learned is um, that Oprah is not above clapping back. <laughs> so. Oh, nice. I saw a lady in my neighborhood last night that looked so much like Oprah that I had to look three times. Wow. Yeah. Like I was just like, wait, is this? <laughs> I'm like pulling my eyeballs open. I'm like, is this? You're like, can I have a yeah. car? <laughs> and then, and she was with a lady that like, didn't look like Gail, but it, it was just... Could have been. It could have been Gail, <laughs> yeah. But go ahead. What did um, Oprah clap back about? So, so um, actually, this is, a, I guess, kind of a, a, a love, too. So, um, Robert Smith, who is a, um, a, a billionaire, um, net worth is $5 billion. He mm-hmm. promised to pay off the student loan debt of, right, of Morehouse, uh, Morehouse uh, the class of 19, Morehouse College. And, um, and you know, which is great, you know, like student loan debt is one, one of the oh, I many thought you were going to say he, like, took it back. No, no, no. Oh, no. yeah, no. That no. was an awesome thing. Yeah, so student loan debt is one of the main things that, you know, holes you know yeah Yeah. (laughs) uh from like building actual wealth so oprah basically um shook hands she posted an instagram picture of her shaking hands with like all of the members of this other college colorado college uh class of 2019 i guess she gave a speech there and gave them a copy of her new book the path made clear and so um somebody i guess was alluding to uh, what Robert Smith did at mm-hmm. Morehouse and commented under her photo and said, should have paid off their student debt, Oprah, LOL. The, who's student debt? <laughs> These white people in Colorado? That's not my job. Well, that's what I think maybe the other this person is not black until they're trying to be funny. Get why, like, here. why don't you pay off their Cause debt? Because y'all got enough. And so Oprah claps back <laughs> with the verified check mark. She's like, hello, at username, Already paid thirteen million dollars in scholarships. I have put over four hundred men through Morehouse, uh, through at Morehouse. Read a book <laughs> before get out of here. You gotta I get out of Oprah's mentions with this nonsense. It. Because she also like has like given away a lot of her, you know, money and uh, free so. Twitter user. What have you at like h- hush? Yeah, I'm get not, out of billionaires' business. Yeah. That was so, yeah. I, I, but I was, I mean, obviously, I loved it. Loved what um, Robert F. Smith did yeah. with Morehouse. Learned and loved that Oprah uh, <laughs> clapped back right. when, because it's like, this, like, what about ism? Like, why, mm-hmm. you know, well, he did this. Why didn't, why don't you do that mm-hmm. for this college? And she's like, no, actually, here are my receipts. I and do you this. actually even care? Right? right? You just want to try to call people right. out. So good for Oprah. She's yeah. like, don't worry about what my billions are over here doing. Exactly. And then um, I don't leave on a on a down note, but this week I'm canceling feelings of worthlessness. Mm, that's important. Um, and it's hard when you are actively engaged in things that like poke at what you feel are your weaknesses, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And it's like you have to remind yourself, like, why am I worthy? Like, why am I like consider capable mm-hmm. like why am i given these opportunities if it's you know sometimes so hard for me to execute or like feel like i'm living up to my potential mm-hmm. um and so i'm canceling those feelings and i am trying to embrace purpose like w- like my purpose as you know a person on this earth who got put here to do certain things and interact with certain people and bring light into certain people's lives um, but also, like, the purpose of the process and the struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, I'm I'm substituting worthlessness for purpose. Yeah. And can I tell you something my therapist told me? What's that? 
like instead of this like capital P purpose, right? Or and this capital letter anything, think about like le- little letter P purposes, mm. right? Like maybe my purpose for the next 15 minutes is to finish this podcast. And so then when that's done, I did it. Mm-hmm. My purpose has been fulfilled. And then my purpose after that is to like make it back to Brooklyn, mm-hmm. right? Like instead of being like, what is my life purpose? Because mm-hmm. I also think about that when I think about the phrase soulmate, right? Mm. When you say, who is my soulmate? That is so daunting. If you never find that one person, you'll never be happy. Who are my soulmates? Mm. Who can my soul connect to? That's multiple people. That's right. friends, right? And so, like, less of an undertaking. Yeah. So I think your purpose is to like do this next thing for the next hour, mm. right? It's like, and maybe though all those little purposes come together for the purpose, like right. the big purpose. But that's good, you know, because I think sometimes we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. A ton. Yeah, I do definitely. Yeah. But. I like that. That's a good cancel. Thanks. No more. No more. Yeah. All righty. We did another one. Um, Guys, give us feedback. You know, we did like a kind of a different format this time. So we would love to hear what you love, what you want to hear. Um, Don't forget about our Patreon, our anchor listener support, mm-hmm. our listener survey. All these links. All in the, the show links. Notes. Please just like check the show notes. I literally put everything in there. <laughs> um, and then our Instagram and Twitter, which is at Yo Business Pod. Uh, you have anything for the people? No. Okay. Thanks for listening. All we right. Love, love you. you guys. Bye.